Now, but that's not all plants can do. Plant-based nutrition also benefits longevity. And this, again, I'm kind of keeping it specific to resistance training. I'll let people talk more about chronic disease in other lectures. Um, our number one killer in the U.S. is cardiovascular disease. So if you can do anything to prevent or slow cardiovascular disease, you're going to increase your chances of living a long, full life. It just so happens a whole food plant-based diet, like the one Dr. Esselstyn advocates, like the one Dr. Kahn advocates, is going to, is the only proven thing to reverse heart disease and to shrink plaques and open up arteries. And if that's our number one killer, that of course is going to help us live a longer, healthier life. So the other thing I'm gonna take a nod to Dr. T. Colin Campbell here from the China study. He and his studies cited um, how higher protein diets stimulated cancer growth in rats when they were studying carcinogens like aflatoxin and liver tumors. But the protein they were using in those studies was casein from milk, which is an animal protein. When they repeated the studies again, using higher low protein levels of plant proteins, they did not see the tumor genesis. Now, again, this is in rats, so we haven't done the study in humans because you can't feed humans carcinogens. But this right here shows that potentially even a higher protein diet with plant proteins is not going to stimulate cancer, which is a another deadly killer in our country, the way a high protein animal-based diet would. So we mentioned on the previous slide that at a higher protein intake, plants build just as much muscle as animal proteins do. And here we can see that they're still having a profoundly different impact on our, on the rest of our body. So you can have the muscle masking, you don't have to have the increased risk of cancer and heart disease. So phytochemicals like polyphenols, I mentioned in the previous slide, are going to bolster our natural um, resistance to aging, our repair mechanisms. Um, and they specifically they stimulate the genes, the sirtuin genes, which are focusing on gene expression and regulating gene expression so that we don't have the wrong genes coming on and the wrong genes turning off. They work directly on that pathway that is really, really important for making sure that we're using the best possible genes for our body so that it's protecting itself and staying young and vital and healthy. Um, the protein from plants as compared to protein from animals is much lower in methionine and branched chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine. You don't need to remember those, not important. But what you do need to remember is that these things are directly related to our body's production of insulin-like growth factor, which is a hormone we release that stimulates growth. It tells us that things are good and it's time to grow, 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 reproduce, whatever. Insulin-like growth factor is also very strongly implicated in cancer risk and in the overall aging rate. In fact, if you look at populations in South America, this is um, information from research Dr. Dr. Valto Longo out of USC has done, there is a, a small population of individuals who have a natural mutation where their body does not produce insulin-like growth factor one. They're normally a lot sh shorter than typical individuals. They're in about five feet or slightly under, but regardless of how much they drink, regardless of how much they smoke, they don't get heart disease, they don't get cancer, and they live their 80s, 90s, and 100s um, because they don't produce this insulin-like growth factor one. So for a long, healthy life, for minimal levels of chronic disease and maximal levels of health span and lifespan, you want to keep IGF-1 low. And plant proteins are much better at doing that. Animal proteins are not. Um, mentioned the insulin sensitivity on the previous slide. Uh, again, there are people in this conference who are more qualified to talk in depth about that than I am. But something that insulin sensitivity um, is directly related to is AMPK, which is adenosine monophyse kinase. Uh, it's basically an energy sensing molecule. When you hear that fasting is beneficial for you, um, AMPK is stimulated by fasting because AMPK senses low energy levels. Same thing with exercise. When you exercise a lot and you burn your energy stores, AMPK is stimulated because it is stimulated by low energy levels and sensing low energy levels, it turns on protective mechanisms to bolster your body against the wear and tear of aging. Um, having better insulin sensitivity from eating a plant-based diet is going to keep AMPK more active more of the time because insulin is sensitive and you're keeping energy levels lower. Um, so again, other researchers can talk more in depth about that, but this is another way that a plant-based diet is going to be beneficial for a long health and lifespan compared to a more omnivorous or standard American diet. All right. Now we're going to go into practical stuff. 
see this handsome devil in the picture here is myself rowing a big dumbbell just to show you um, that plants don't make you weak. And I included in this slide because that bottom bullet point there, intensity does matter. Research does show that. Um, and I could have included more citations there. But to start off, strength training recommendations for um, lifespan for mortality risk, I should say, not lifespan, for lowering your risk of dying from all causes has a U-shaped curve. Um, so I mentioned with when I mentioned grip strength, it was impressive that it had a line rather than a curve. Strength training in general has a U-shaped curve, which is what you normally see in biological systems, which means that as you do more, your risk goes down. I'm making a gesture with my hands. I'm not sure if you can see it, but you picture your risk going down as you do more. There's a bottoming out point at the bottom of the U where your risk is the least. And as you keep doing more, if you do strength training more and more and more often, your risk actually starts to go back up a little bit. So there's a sweet spot, a Goldilocks spot for resistance training. And there are a lot of factors here. This was, um, these recommendations come from a big meta analysis. So this is a lot of people doing a lot of things. Um, and they, they weren't able to go into specifics too much with that large of a population. But by and large, people who did two to three strength training sessions a week for an hour or less saw the best results in terms of their mortality risk. Um, and someone who's training more than that, five, six, seven times a week, your risk of dying is not as high as someone who doesn't train. So it's not like it goes all the way back up. It's just not quite as good as those people who are a little more moderate. Um, so doing it a little left often, like say, for example, every other day would be optimal if your goal is absolute longevity. Um, training all muscle groups of your body for five, eight exercises. This is more of an exercise science recommendation. There's not a lot of specifics, as I mentioned, with the, um, the longevity research yet. There's more work to be done, which is exciting. 